Well, you're most welcome to today's talk, Tuesday, the 25th of July. Now, I want to look at the ongoing problem with vitamin D deficiency, particularly with Alzheimer's disease today. There's just so much low hanging fruit to improve health that we're simply not picking in the Western world. And the vitamin D situation is certainly one of them. Um, we're going to get on to Alzheimer's disease in a minute. This is a real biological organic disease. So we see the healthy brain here with the grey matter on the outside and the white matter on the inside. And here we see the totally shrunken, shriveled up uh, Alzheimer's brain, which is responsible for the uh, disorientation and the well progressive irre irreversible impairment of intellectual function, which is the definition of, uh, of dementia. But let's look first of all at how common the prevalence of vitamin D is. Um, so this study here... Now, the data from the United States is a little out of date now, um, but let's look at what we've got. Vitamin D deficiency and insufficiency in the US adults. Uh, now, this is published in 2018. Not a lot published since then, really, in terms of good quality surveys that I've found. Vitamin D deficiency and vitamin D insufficiency are increasing at a global level, they say. And th 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 this remains true. Um, part of the problem is... Um, People have been advised to keep out the sun to prevent melanoma, which of course is correct. We don't want sunburn and melanoma. But there again, the vast majority of our vitamin D is made by exposure to the sun. So there's a balance there to be attained that we haven't yet attained, I don't think. Um, now, that they uh, they looked at... So this, this is the vitamin D in the blood. Serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So that, that's the vitamin D in the blood there that we could test for and this is the way the, the blood test test for this one so this is this is kind of what we can look for Twenty six thousand adults um, now vitamin d deficiency they defined as less than 50 nanomoles per liter which is kind of the traditional european way and the traditional american way of describing it it's exactly the same figure as 20 nanograms per mil so 50 nanomoles per liter is exactly the same blood level as 20 nanograms per mil it's exactly the same and vitamin D insufficiency a bit higher, 20 to 25 nanograms per mil. Now, the, the results are really quite horrendous, actually. Um, this is based on data from, uh, I think, 2001 to 2011, but published in 2018. And I don't think things are that much better now. Maybe a little bit, but not a lot. Vitamin D deficiency, 28.9% of the population. Vitamin D insufficiency, 41% of the population. This is this is This is such a... Uh, an epidemic well a pandemic really as we'll see in a minute of course adults with darker colored skin less education poor uh, obese physically inactive and infrequent milk consumers had lower levels now the natural milk will contain some vitamin d but not a lot um, but in, in the united states they uh, add vitamin d to milk in a lot of places in the united kingdom we don't um, so while this would apply, milk drinkers in the United States are going to get more vitamin D from drinking milk. In the UK, that is much less true. Obese adults, uh, three times higher prevalence of vitamin D deficiency. The thing is with vitamin D, of course, it's a fat soluble vitamin. So if you've got a lot of uh, adipose fatty tissue, the vitamin D goes into the fatty tissue, very much less left in the blood. So uh, patients with obesity need much more vitamin D to top them uh, up. Um, three times more likely. Um, and, and this is going to add to the problems of obesity, of course. Um, and uh, physically inactive adults, twice as likely. And the, uh, the vitamin D insufficiency was also uh, present in both of these groups. Now, um, this is uh, another study here. Um, Bit, the, the data is actually slightly more up to date, but again, a bit out of date. But um, the levels of deficiency there are described as less. But of course, it depends on how you d sort of define your levels, doesn't it? Obviously, um, persons with higher uh, persons with higher vitamin D uh, dietary intake or, or who use supplements had a lower prevalence of at risk uh, vitamin uh, of at risk deficiency or inadequacy. In other words. Um, vit higher dietary intake or supplements obviously really are going to reduce the levels of uh, insufficiency and deficiency and um, the levels being advised by our governments in my view are still very low now does this apply worldwide well vitamin d deficiency 
2.0, an update on the current status of the world, published in Nature magazine. Uh, and this is pretty up-to-date data now. Most studies uh, did not meet the basic requirement of a nutritional interventional study. Now, this illustrates a big part of the problem. Um, the, these studies are largely on vitamin D, are largely observational or correlation studies. Some are prospective and many are retrospective, but there are prospective studies as well. But the point is, there's no good quality studies that show, well, there's lots of studies that show, yes, there's correlations between various diseases like Alzheimer's disease, heart disease, diabetes, many things with vitamin D deficiency. But there's not the evidence that shows that if you supplement with vitamin D, these go away or are prevented. Because, of course, pharmaceutical industry can't make any money out of these. This is the problem. So we have to assume that correcting the deficiency will improve the condition, which is a very reasonable assumption. But do we actually know this? Well, from interventional studies by sort of proper randomized double-blind controlled trial data, the answer is no, not really. So this is why there's always a bit of, a, a bit of um, debate about this. Um, but but to, to, me, to me, the evidence is, is, is simply overwhelming. But do we have the interventional studies? No. Are we likely to get the interventional studies? No, because pharmaceutical industry organised most of these interventional studies and they're not going to do it for something they can't make any money out of. Uh, th this is the state of healthcare in the world at the moment. It's money related, which is um, unfortunate. But uh, th this is uh, m most, so most studies do not meet that pity. But, but there we go. But uh, about 40% of Europeans are deficient in vitamin D. So pretty comparable levels, really, to the United States. 13% severely deficient. <laughs> really quite high amounts. Now, this study here took vitamin D deficiency, again, as being less than 50 nanomoles per litre. Or uh, So the vitamin D deficiency, yeah, they took it as less than 50 nanomoles per litre, which is 20 nanograms per mil. And they say quite clearly associated with unfavorable skeletal outcomes, in, including fractures and bone loss. Um, I mean, are we in a situation whereby giving vitamin D we could prevent some fractures? Excruciatingly painful condition associated with huge implications for health and well-being and, and health care provision. You know, it's so simple if we could just reduce that. Levels of less, th uh, sorry, le levels of greater than, so that one's greater than, isn't it? Greater than 50 nanomoles or 20 nanograms is therefore the primary treatment goal. And it wouldn't be hard to titrate the population up to that quite readily. Severe vitamin D deficiency below 30, less than 30 nanograms per litre or 12 nanograms per mil dramatically increases. And remember, this is quite a large percentage of the population. This is, so they're talking here about 13% of the population in, in Europe with the very low levels, dramatically increases the risk of excess mortality. That means you're more likely to die, simple as that. Infections, more likely to get infections, such as COVID, uh, influenza, uh, and, and many other diseases, and should be avoided wherever possible, obviously. Uh, given its rare side effects and its relatively wide safety margin, it may be, a, it may be an important, inexpensive and safe adjuvant therapy for many diseases. Uh, but then they go on to say, to cover themselves, future large and well-designed studies should evaluate this further. But of course, they're not going to. That is simply not going to happen unless governments take that uh, on. Um, so I've gone on a bit longer than I meant to there. Um, I think we might do... No, we'll, we'll carry on. We'll carry on and do the dementia, I think. We can always uh, split it afterwards. Um, vitamin D deficiency... Uh, vitamin D supplementation and uh, incidence of dementia. Now, um, cognitive status. Vitamin D exposure in this study here. This, this, uh, this, this, I'll put the link. I've always put the links. Check it out for yourself. Vitamin D exposure was associated with forty percent lower dementia increase versus no exposure. So people with vitamin D got forty percent uh, less dementia if they had vitamin D uh, additional vitamin D. Uh, and we did look at this before, so I'm not going to do this one in detail, but it was a good study. The other study I want to look at today, low vitamin D serum levels um, as a risk factor of Alzheimer's disease. And this is a review and meta-analysis. So did this show the same thing? Uh, so serum vitamin D levels related to cognitive dysfunction. 
brain thinking not working properly. For example, Alzheimer's disease. Now, they did say past studies vary in their results. That's why they wanted to do a meta-analysis. And this is up-to-date data, up to December 2022. Now, Alzheimer's disease accounts for 75% of dementia. So dementia is a progressive irreversible impairment of intellectual function. Once you've lost the intellectual function, you can never get it back. Never, ever, ever get it back. By definition, that is dementia. Now, of course, sometimes intellectual function is diminished for a period of time. You correct the underlying condition and then you get the you go back to normal function. That's called delirium. That's a separate condition. So delirium is reversible. Dementia, by definition, is irreversible. But going on to this study, this meta-analysis, uh, six studies, 10,884 individuals. Vitamin D receptors are present throughout the brain, so it makes sense that this would work because there's lots of vitamin D receptors. Uh, patient vitamin D serum levels less than 25 nanograms per mil had an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. It's really quite simple compared to those with higher levels. And the hazard ratio was 1.59. In, in other words, patients with higher levels of vitamin D were 59% less likely to get dementia. Um, the, the fact that this is not being acted on really is quite, uh, really is quite incredible. And um, I've just put this in parenthesis because it's from a different study. Um, but uh, severe, de severe deficiency having the strongest association. So it does make sense, doesn't it? Compared to moderate deficiency. So the lower the vitamin D, the greater the risk of dementia. It's what the studies are showing. Very, very simple. The lower the levels of vitamin D, the greater the risk of dementia. And like me, I can't imagine there's any of us out, any of you have been unaffected by dementia, close friends, family, um, at work. Um, I'm sure, sure we've all had relatives with levels of dementia. Uh, uh, like me, I'm sure you have. Very few people will be unaffected by dementia. Back to the original study. Vitamin D pro may promote the clearing of amyloid plaques. Now, this amyloid is an abnormal protein. So in the brain, we get... So if you have lots of nerve cells here in the brain with all their interconnections, this, this amyloid um, is, is abnormal protein, which is laid down in, in clumps in the brain. Uh, this abnormal amyloid protein. So... Um, Vitamin D may promote the clearing of amyloid plaques. So it may actually promote the clearing of the plaques. Now, the, the nerve cells which have been damaged aren't going to recover uh, significantly, but um, good news if it can get rid of that. Uh, vitamin D may also prevent cognitive dysfunction via neuroprotection, protecting the nerves. Neurotrophy, that is nutrition of the nerves. Neurotransmission, that is the transmission across the synapses between the nerves, and neuroplasticity is the formation of new, uh, potentially new nerve cells, but certainly new connections between them. Um, potential to prevent neuroinflammation, and also we know it inhibits pro-inflammatory cytokines. And yet, Department of Health and Social Care in the UK, current guidelines, <laughs> check this out uh, just last night, um, still advising minute doses of supplementation. In the UK, just during winter and autumn, everyone is advised to take supplement containing 10 micrograms for 100 international units of vitamin D a day. Now, I can't tell you what to take, but um, I take uh, at least uh, 10 times that a day. Personally, take 100 micrograms of vitamin D a day with 100 micrograms of vitamin K2. And uh, many people think magnesium uh, supplement is a good idea with the vitamin D. But I'm personally taking 100 micrograms of vitamin D that's 4,000 international units and 100 micrograms of vitamin K2 with that. If you're eating fermented foods, you don't need the K2 supplement. But most of us don't eat that many fermented foods. So laughably low uh, recommendations in the United Kingdom, uh, but we have huge amounts of dementia. In the States, not a lot better. Adult dose uh, recommendation in the States is uh, 600 international units. And again, I often take 10 times that. Um, and uh, it, it, I think it does go up to 800 over the age of 70. But strange that governments are admitting the problem, uh, but not really advising any solution. Ideally, everyone would have their vitamin D levels checked and titrated by their doctor or healthcare provider. Needless to say, that doesn't happen very often, unfortunately. 
Um, so there we go. Um, dementia, big problem. Vitamin D, I am totally convinced, uh, is a big factor. And yet uh, national guidelines are simply not reflecting this. And clinical trials are simply not reflecting this. Um, it's almost as if there's vested interest in policy making. I'm, I'm actually not being sarcastic. I'm not saying there is. But it, it, why don't they get their act together? And why doesn't the government organise or, or um, sponsor a university to do a trial on this? They could do this. The ability is there because the pharmaceutical industry aren't going to. But these government guidelines, to me, are um, out of date. We'll leave it there. Um, thank you for watching. And um, it's a bit overcast here today, but if you can get some sun this time of year without sunburning. Um, so basically, if you're out in the sun and you've got fairly good uh, body exposure, uh, if you're out, suppose it took like two hours to get sunburned. If you're out for about an hour, well below the time it takes to get sunburned, you're going to make about 20,000 units of vitamin D a, a day. And yet the government guidelines in the UK is 400 units a day. Can you see the sort of mismatch here? Leave it there. Um, thank you for watching.